What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Check out past episodes, Lance. I've had some cool episodes. And, you know, I just try and think for this interview what ones I should mention. You know, ones that are the most popular aren't always the ones that are most known. Um, you know, the P90X founder, uh, Tony Horton, I had, does talk about his journey, but was interesting. Lance, I like hearing the low points sometimes. Like, you know, great, you sold a billion dollars worth of CDs, like you, uh, you almost want to love to hate that person. But, you know, he actually started off as a street mime. He was, he drove cross country and did street miming to make food and rent money when he first started out. So he put his hat on the street. He would do street mime. I even made him do some street mime moves on the interview since it was video. So check it out. Um, I had Julie Clark, um, founder of uh, Baby Einstein. And she grew it from, you know, $20 million with five employees end up selling to Disney. But she talked about beating cancer twice, you know, and it's the real stuff behind building a company. Because as you and I both know, Lance, you were saying, there's people working on our house that are making noises. Then we're in virtual schooling with our young kids. There's so much stuff go that goes on, you know, behind the scenes that uh, these are real human beings and have real other issues besides their business. So check out that other episodes on inspiredinsider.com. And um, I, I'm really excited about this conversation today. Um, pink box donuts and many, much more. I mean, I was looking at this, Lance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to properly introduce you, but um, I'm a healthy person. I like kombucha. I do intermittent fasting. I almost hate your website. You make the product look so good that I would ditch, especially now we're talking January, but I would ditch everything, all my health for that delicious cinnamon roll dipped in maple frosting. It, it looks amazing. But before I introduce you properly, Lance, um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with John Corcoran. Um, Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships by helping you run your podcast. And Lance, as you know, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships in podcasts over the past since 2008 has been a way that I, the people I admire, the people I want to give to, I have them on my podcast. I learn more about them and share their message with the world. So if you have thought about starting a podcast, if you're a business, I think hands down, like, I don't care if you go with us or anyone, I would have been saying this for a decade. If you have a business, you should have a podcast, just like you have a website, like you have a, what you wouldn't have not have a website. So you know, we're obviously still on the forefront in the, in the beginning of podcasting, but that's what I believe. And that's, I live that. So go to rise25.com if you have questions and you've been a guest Lance on so many podcasts. Um, but, uh, if you don't know Lance, you should know Lance and you will know Lance right now, but Lance Growlick is the founder and CEO of Ion Franchising. He's an industry leading franchise, um, consulting and development group, and they represent over 500 franchise brands. I think is it over 650 now franchise brands? About 650. These days. Um, and <laughs> business opportunities within 90 different categories. He helps prospective entrepreneurs find their perfect franchise for free, actually. For free, he doesn't even charge, but he gets a success fee. It's not like he's working for free or anything like that. So don't worry. He's not, you know, gonna, he's still gonna feed his family. Um, he also assists independent business owners in creating a franchise system. So if you have a business and you're like, Listen, I need to create a franchise system around it. You can contact Lance and you'll see why he's got the chops to help you. But he started out in a family business on Wall Street. After receiving his economics degree, he joined TGI Fridays in Arizona. And as a key executive, he was vital in the rapid growth. The rapid growth to over $225 million organization. And he was a multi-unit, multi-state franchisee of Wingstop and Krispy Kreme Donuts. You just love those donuts. And he's become an industry leader, uh, a donut expert, really. And as I mentioned before, the founder of the donut chain called Pink Box in Las Vegas. So if you want to throw all of your health goals out the window, go to their website and check out them watching, making one of their donuts because I am a sucker for cinnamon rolls. And then yeah. you couple that with donuts. 
Um, he's got so much experience. Check him out. Uh, Lance, thanks for joining me. Dr. Jeremy, thanks uh, for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to be here. You know, um, I'm almost go a little bit in reverse. Okay. So let's talk about pink box for a second and sure. why you decided to start that. Yeah. You know, so first of all, I am a consummate serial entrepreneur. And I, I think the definition for me on that is besides always wanting to start businesses, I, I get bored very, very easily. I, I had plenty of OCD, um, as a kid, um, my mom couldn't keep me entertained on a regular basis. I was always involved in a lot of sports. In fact, uh, these days, it seems like my kids are not doing as much as me. I don't know if it's a generational thing. So, uh, you know, I, I had already been with Krispy Kreme. I had already created a very successful uh, burger and frozen custard concept in Las Vegas that was outrageously successful and won all kinds of awards that I ended up selling. And, uh, and a gentleman that I knew from the restaurants called me and he said, hey, can you create me a donut shop? I said, sure, what's, what's, what's the interest in a donut shop? He goes, well, by my house, there's no, there's no donut shops, but something really special and something really good. So lucky me, I, I knew the broker that owned the large shopping center closest to his house that already had a Starbucks and an Einstein bagels. Perfect place to put a donut shop um, to get that morning traffic. And it turned out we, I created a, a gourmet donut shop. He admittedly had one thing in mind and his, the, the thing he, that he had in mind was the name. I said, well, what do you got so far? And he goes, well, the name. And he got all excited. He giggled and he said, Pink Box Donuts. I said, it's a great name. So I ended up trademarking the name. And why did he pick that? Why did he, how did he come up with that name? Well, for, first of all, in, in the bakery business, of course, I grew up in New York and in the bakery business, my grandfather happened to own a chain of supermarkets. Uh, my grandfather from Poland that I barely understood anything he said, but he was a carpenter for the old country. Consummate you know, it's funny. My grandpa from Poland was a carpenter as well. Oh, how funny. Yeah. <laughs> so he, uh, he ended up having a chain of groceries and, and, and with a bakery in there. And, and many people know, uh, even today, and especially back in the old days, the bakery boxes were always white. And one of the bakery companies at some point said, all right, we, we, we need, and it was a thin walled, the boxes came flat, you assembled them in the store, and they came in all sizes, but it was always white. Sometimes they were craft, you know, the natural. Krispy Kreme also, white, yeah. They, they, they were white, although they had a pattern, uh, their, their logo on it, but it was a pattern. And, um, but there was a, a company one day that said, I'm going to create a different box. I'm going to create a pink box to get attention. So that pink box also became an industry standard. So bakeries, a lot of the bakeries would choose to have a pink box. And you knew that the bakeries that had the pink box, something special was going on inside. Mm. So uh, he uh, was pretty well traveled with his family business. This gentleman that had, had called me and said, create pink box. And I so, so here's the deal. I'm going to take a nice chunk of equity. You're going to put up all the money. I have other projects I'm doing, but I'll create something special for us and make it happen. So I did. And we uh, created over 100 donuts to start with um, before we opened, skinnied the menu down a little bit. But we wanted to be a true gourmet donut. At that time, the only real gourmet donut or upscale, different, unique donut shop in existence that I knew of was Voodoo Donuts out of Portland. And I had never been to Voodoo before, but I clearly was able to see in 2011 when we were creating the brand Pink Box, I was easily uh, able to see what they had. And we created some special donuts. But I'll tell you, my favorite donut that I created, I have a friend that, lo that uh, lives locally in Las Vegas and owns some very popular restaurants. And I was sitting at the bar with my wife one night and he was uh, working on a new pork dish that he was having me sample. But he gave me an order of our favorite item, which is uh, bacon wrapped dates. So I was eating a bacon wrapped date, and I was like, dates, almonds, blue cheese, bacon, balsamic reduction. I can make a donut. I can make this into a donut. Mm. Blue cheese, bacon, almonds. So I created a donut called Date with a Nutty Pig. And it wasn't that popular. I knew it wouldn't be. But it was that donut that everybody came in to ask about because they would see it. And, you know, we all talk in marketing about stickiness. We talk about points of differentiation. We talk about the secret sauce. 
and I help quite a few brands get off the, off the ground, uh, emerging restaurant brands. I'm working with one right now I was on the phone with back in New York all day, all morning. And uh, unfortunately, 7 a.m. my time I started. And, you know, it's all about your secret sauce. Why are you different? Why should somebody come to you? And with Pink Box, we had more donut varieties than anybody. We freshly baked our product throughout the day, not necessarily one time a day, one fry. And as bakeries would say, we did two fries a day. And, and, uh, and we'd have donuts. We would surprise people by having donuts that no one else would ever have. And we'd switch up the varieties pretty frequently. We'd always have the core items like Krispy Kreme when I was there. We had the core items all the time. Krispy Kreme didn't really shake things up too much. You know, it's funny because I remember, I love this differentiation. I'm wondering what other places that you consulted with and had them do one of these, like almost like the bacon wrap date blue cheese, like equivalent. Cause I remember going, even if we don't buy that item, it's still a talking point. It's still a marketing point. Yeah. Um, there was like a, I forgot what it, it was like some hamburger place and they had like a $400 hamburger and it was yep. all the just top grade ingredients and I never ordered it, but it was like, oh, wow, that's, that's really cool. And it's a talking point for the, for the business. Absolutely. And, and especially, you know, with the birth of social media and especially like Instagram, everybody loves to put those crazy pictures, you know, the solid gold burger, donut, whatever it might be. Yeah. Or like you said, the, you know, $400 burger. My burger place was actually called Create. And Create, you had an opportunity to create your own burger. And there was a checklist and you can check off for the segment of the population that love doing that. And you create a different burger every time. And the beauty of it was you didn't get killed on the price because you can add banana peppers and alfalfa sprouts and, you know, mushrooms and this and that for no additional charge. There were a few extra upsells like, uh, you know, bacon and, and, and other items. Um, and we had like five, six different cheeses that you would choose from. So it was fantastic, but, but knowing that there's a, a segment of the population, kind of like comparing to Starbucks, you know, there are people that go to Starbucks, oh, would you like a latte? Would you like a caramel macchiato? And you're like, I just want a cup of coffee. That's all I want. And we had that same thing. We had uh, predetermined combos. We had a burger called the Modernist that had, you know, mushrooms and avocado and uh, chipotle mayo. We had one called the classic, which is a classic burger, like In-N-Out, the famous In-N-Out burger, just like that. So we had burgers uh, and it was an art theme. Uh, I mentioned the classic, the modernist, and there was one called the impressionist. Um, and, uh, you know, anyway, it was, it was a phenomenal concept. It was different. Um, but look, you know, giving birth to your own brand is the hardest thing that anybody can do. But if you have a passion for it, it can be crazy successful and create should have been that business. Uh, but, you know, I got divorced and had some partners that maybe I should not have brought into the partnership. And as we all know, those things make uh, growth cumbersome. Talk about sticking out because you represent a lot of different franchises. Maybe talk about a few and what is the sticking out point? What is that? Sure you know, blue cheese donut or $400 burger for, for some of the franchises that yeah. you, cause I know you, again, like just to say, when someone comes to you, you place them specifically with the, the goals that they may have, the, the financing or finances that may have, you know, cause a lot of people Lance go to Google and just try and do all the searches. Whereas I am in life, you know, the biggest, the best advice I ever got is find a mentor who's done what you've done, who's doing what you do, and they will shortcut the process. So I don't see any reason why someone wouldn't go to you as opposed to Google because you've done this. But um, talk about some of the franchises you represent and, and some, some things that make them stick out. Sure. Yeah. And, and, uh, and by the way, the terminology that I, uh, that I use for what you're describing is resource up. Get somebody, it's the same reason that anybody starts a business. The first two people they need to be hiring or consulting with are an attorney and an accountant to understand even what they're getting into. And if those two agree on certain things for you, that's fantastic. I mean, start with what kind of entity you should be setting up. Um, so regarding sticking out the secret sauce, if you will, 
I have a brand called Smash My Trash. Smash My Trash. If, if you know anything about commercial trash, and let's say you own a restaurant or a retail store, you know, you get charged based on your, you know, you, you have the rental of your, of your container. You have the frequency in which it gets picked up and, uh, you know, some extra charges if things are sticking out of it or what have you. Smash My Trash has a patent pending technology. Nobody else is doing it where they spend 15 minutes or so compacting your trash so you can reduce your, your trash usage or, or trash fees um, by, uh, could be up to 70%, which is amazing for 15 minutes worth of work. And that franchise is hot, hot, hot. And it's incredibly unique. They should um, go to people's houses with all the Amazon boxes people get. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. You hit that one on the head. You're right. Don't come to my house. You'll see all those boxes. So uh, the next one I would say, I mean, there, there's, there's tons of them. Yeah, uh, keep going. I, I could listen to this all day, Lance. Keep let's, going. Uh, yeah. let's talk about college hunks hauling junk and moving. So college hunks has been around a long time. And college hunks, so, you know, what is it, 11 years ago or so, Google started? They were on Shark Tank also, I remember. College I hunks? I think, I think, I think so. That, Maybe I early think on. they were. I have several brands that were on Shark okay. Tank. So college hunks hauling junk. As a matter of fact, the next one I'll mention will be a Shark Tank brand. Um, they might have been on Shark Tank. So the young founders at the time, uh, you know, grew, grew their business uh, just out of sheer amazing customer service, know-how, and just taught. You know, the old days of franchising was, hey, I'm going to teach you something you don't know. And I've already made the mistakes. So you're going to be successful because, you know, you're not going to make the same mistakes I did, and you're just going to give me a fee. That's franchising. Well, when Google came about and technology came about and the internet was really born, it changed everything for so many franchise brands because now it's incredibly difficult for the mom and pops to compete because what brands like College Hunks Hauling Junk and Moving are doing is they're dominating search engine optimization. They're dominating the internet with their keywords and everything else. And what's happening is when somebody wants to move, either they're going to quickly you know, do a Google search and they're going to find college hunks due to the local SEO, and which is going to go right to the franchise, franchisee. Yeah, they get tons or, of leads. Or corporate. So, so basically, last I checked, it could be as, mu as much as 80% of the business that a, that a franchisee of college hunks is going to do is, is generated is a lead from corporate due to the website or the corporate call center, which is incredible. Yeah. Not only do they get the business system, they get the leads and the customers, which is ultimately really fueling, helping fuel their business even more. A absolutely 100%. The next business I'm going to tell you about is Cineholic. Cineholic was on Shark Tank about six years ago. And Cineholic is, talk about secret sauce. You mentioned cinnamon buns. Well, they have cinnamon buns, 23 varieties of cinnamon buns. In fact, the one closest to my house, I was showing a friend recently, they have, an, they have thousands of reviews on even Yelp, dare I say Yelp. They have thousands of reviews on Yelp and an, an, like 4.8 stars or something like that. I mean, their, their rating is incredible. People love it. But here's the twist. You ask for secret sauce. It's vegan. Vegan. Really? Wow. Completely vegan. Sign me up. So it's quote unquote healthy. Well, <laughs> you know, the, re the reality is like my daughter is 19 and, and she's got, you know, she, for, for medical reasons, uh, nothing terribly serious, but she has to eat really healthy and yeah. she tries to eat vegan. And, uh, you know, we, we do not eat there frequently. Where uh, are they? Are they all over but the country? They're, or? they're all over. Uh, I don't know if it's about 15. I want to try one today. Like, do 15, they have one in Scottsdale? 15 <laughs> states or so. But okay. it's, uh, you know, look, it's easier than a donut shop because you're just, you're just baking. You're not worrying about deep yeah. fryers and all well, that. Well, I mean, I'm lactose intolerant. And, and uh, <laughs> so a vegan something, you know, I don't have to look at the ingredients. And, and if you have, like you said, restrictions on your diet for health purposes, it helps to know. Like, yeah, it's not in yeah. there. So uh, what else? Keep going. Like I can listen to this all day. Like I'll, let's go I'll, through all six hundred and fifty. Let me. No, yeah, of course. No. Let me. <laughs> let me give you. Uh, let me give you one that's different from all the others. There's uh, a business. 
uh, I don't want to really say networking. It's more like uh, an entrepreneurship club that you join that's a franchise that prior to the pandemic, they were only face to face. And, you know, they started in the Phoenix market and they were did incredibly well with uh, development and connections. And it's more than networking. It's if an entrepreneur in the group has an idea and wants to run it past the group, it's an incredible, incredible franchise um, that I might end up, being, end up doing in Las Vegas, by the way, with another partner of mine. And so the funny part, though, is not so funny. The pandemic hits. Now what do they do? They were all face to face. They never did virtual because as any business people, you know, you want to shake hands. You want to be eye to eye with people. And uh, so they started doing Zoom. And what did they quickly realize with Zoom is, uh, and sorry, Zoom, we're on it right now, but they didn't love the breakout rooms because before their events, they have a mixer of, you know, 50 people or so. And then after the events, people kind of break up and talk to the people that they really want to do business with. So these guys were tech guys, all kinds of other business experience, the franchisor I'm talking about, the parent company. So they jumped into action and they spent a fortune. And they created their own Zoom-like platform that is wow. amazing. And I've never, <clears throat> you've walked into a ballroom before, perhaps in a casino in Vegas for an event, and you see rounds of 10 set up, you know, tables of 10, and you see different people and you want to sit down somewhere. That's exactly what they created. So you can see people at the table, you can sit down and then start talking to them. It's I love a, that. It's amazing. There's even a little bar in there. In the, in, the, in the social room. I don't know how you get the alcohol. There's an interface with your computer of the USB or what, but uh, we'll see how that goes. So that that's, sounds- uh, that's called M3 Linked. M3 Linked. So um, Lance, I want to talk about Krispy Kreme also. Like what makes for someone running a successful franchise? Like you obviously have been successful with running, you know, we talked about Wingstop and Krispy Kreme. You know, not all franchisees are created equal, I imagine. What, what made what you were doing more successful than, I'm sure it's competitive as well. Like they're competing against each other in different states just because you're com- competitive nature. What, what were the things you did to run the companies um, that, yeah. that other you, people should uh, be doing? By the way, we didn't talk... We didn't talk long before we went live here. And, uh, and I'll tell you, you're hitting all the, the high points here. And I mean that sincerely. This is, these are great questions because this is, these are things that I discuss with prospective franchisees every day, whether it's an experienced private equity guy that I'm working with right now or uh, someone that's been a corporate guy for X amount of years to a 28-year-old that's had some success and is very aggressive and really wants to be their own boss. Everybody's a little different. But the formula to me is quite simple. Um, if you're going to have employees, especially you need people skills and you need to, uh, I helped someone once with a business that was an investment banker that was very wealthy, very successful, but he did not know how to manage hourly employees and they Different robbed, skill set. They yeah. robbed him blind Really, and, and, and he just didn't know, but there are certain metrics and systems you put in place to have those safeguards and, 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 and know, have those guardrails in place to understand when you're doing well and, and why and, and vice versa. So having the people skills is fantastic. The interpersonal skills, fantastic, required uh, to some degree. It depends what business you're in. If you're working by yourself and there's no employees, then you don't need to worry about that, but you still need interpersonal skills if you're doing any kind of sales or any type of uh, you know, B2B type scenario. Regarding um, you know, <laughs> most franchises don't necessarily care what your past experience is, as long as your resume represents some level of success, um, o- only because, you know, if you've had success in something before, um, and that could be defined a lot of different ways, you know, are you disciplined? Are you committed? Are you able to work on your own? Are you, are, are you really fully committed to developing and, and doing everything you need to do to build your own business out? Um, and good franchisors can really spot that. And a good franchisor doesn't want to just take a, 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 an initial franchise fee or check to get, get, get rolling. Yeah. I mean, so, they represent the brand. And if bingo. you run it terribly, well, guess what? You look bad in all other states, all our locations. 
I mean, big black eye on the brand. Yeah. You, don't, you don't, you definitely don't want that. But, you know, really matching people with the brand that's appropriate for them. So it's, it's a big lifestyle choice, too. I've worked with quite a few people in the restaurant business that were franchisees of the same brand as myself, whether it be Wingstop or Krispy Kreme, that, you know, probably shouldn't be in business for themselves. Um, they probably should have hired somebody to run this business as opposed to, hey, I get weekends off all the time. I'm not, I'm not answering my phone when my people really need me. And, uh, you know, that's a, it's a bad thing. So it, it's not, it's easy for me, um, you know, yes, the investment level, um, they have to be capitalized to a certain degree. I mean, it, you, you don't need a lot of extra working capital, but you have the ability to, look, businesses don't ramp up as quickly as everyone would think all of the time. You know, I opened my first wing stop. It was doing five grand a week because there wasn't a lot of brand recognition. When I opened store four, it did like 34,000 opening week, which at the time was a wing stop opening week record. But, you know, so, you know, and that's, and that's a whole other thing. Some people have an appetite for, you know, a lot of territory and they want an emerging brand and they want to get a good deal from the franchisor and other people call me and say, Lance, I just want a really established brand. Well, define really established. <laughs> you know, is that a thousand locations? If it's already at a thousand locations, it might be a little bit difficult to find you the territory that you want. Like I had a lady in El Paso, Texas, not too long ago. And she says to me, I would love to be in, uh, in El Paso. I inquired with Sinaholic and guess what? They were sold out. Someone bought the entire area. Mm, very interesting. Talk about that for a second. So, you know, you know, placing the right person. You mentioned lifestyle, right, with Krispy Kreme. So what were the things you did maybe differently from maybe within Krispy Kreme? Maybe you take the least successful Krispy Kreme and the most successful. You said maybe for you, you would hire certain staff, right, to manage it. What were some other things that you did? And you're like an entrepreneur at heart. You're innovative. Are there certain restrictions that you had to pull back on your creative reins because of being in a franchise? Well, I could tell you that, you know, the, the old mistake about uh, what, what is the old saying about um, uh, do the same thing over and over again? Oh, yes. Well, insanity. insanity. Yeah, exactly. Insanity. So I, I that is something that I think about often and in that if you see the same mistakes in front of your eyes on a regular basis in any franchise, you need to ask yourself, why is this happening? Is it because I hired the wrong individual? Is it because the training is inadequate? Is it a combination of both? Um, and then, you know, the old expression in education, my, my wife's a school principal, my mother was a retired school principal. There's an old educational saying, which is teach to the test. So are we teaching to the test? If we want to give exceptional customer service, I need to get out there and model exceptional customer service. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you so much for coming today. So I know it's your first time here. Blue, you know, and all of a sudden give them the spiel on why they're here and why they care about you. Um, Customer service should be important, but as we all know, some brands focus on it more than others. So the training, how is the training? I can give you an example at Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme, we were the second franchisees of Krispy Kreme. Then they exploded and had a ton of growth right after that. And what I can tell you is, and this is the other piece that I didn't exactly mention, but it's, it'll be in my future book on hiring for the restaurant industry, which will be happening. Most people hire the wrong person in the first place. And then they expect this high school kid, college kid, retired person, whoever, they expect them to all of a sudden get better. But guess what? People are going to be the best they ever will be at the interview. So if they don't knock your socks off for all the right reasons for the position you're hiring, and there's certain metrics that I look for in the hiring process, but the bottom line is, and doing multiple interviews is always the best thing. If you're going to do one interview, one and done, and you're hiring them, 70% of the time that doesn't work out because then all of a sudden they'll be late. 
They'll smell like 10 packs of cigarettes the next time they show up. Give them an opportunity to prove to you that they deserve the job, however desperate you might be because you had people quit or there's a pandemic or whatever the reason is. You have to take your time because if you're going to have these new employees essentially practice on your customers because they're not good at what they're doing yet, customers hate that. Customers hate that. They recognize the turnover and they don't want to be associated with your brand. So anyway, but Krispy Kreme, I kept noticing that newer bakers would screw up when they made the original glazed donut or the shell donut, but it's the same product. One just doesn't have a hole. And it would either, the hole would close up because possibly the donut wasn't proofed right. There was a lot of different things that went on. So what my team created, because again, definition of insanity, doing it, you know, same thing over and over again, expecting different results. We were training people according to the training guides. Well, the training guides weren't good enough. They had, they had, they had loopholes and there was some gray area and you don't want gray area in, in, uh, in, in surgery or in donut making. <laughs> so we ended up creating sort of an addendum for our team to use to ensure they hit the mark. So maybe it was taking the temperature of the dough one extra step or you know, making sure the temperature of the chocolate was right you know, for the icing part because that was the other thing that got screwed up. In fact, I have it in my house. I have a copy of it. It's a laminated chart with donut pictures on it that is essentially a troubleshooting guide that we created and then corporate adopted it. I mean, that's, I guess, one of the things when you are one of the first few franchises, right? You have to improve this. You may have to improve the systems a bit. And that's exactly right. And then look, don't get me wrong. What is fantastic about franchising, and I'm not complaining about what we had to do because Krispy Kreme, look, they manufacture their own equipment. They have all their own patents. They did, did some unique things that other donor brands would never have done. So they did some great things and they, and they produced a, a great, amazing glazed donut that everybody goes crazy over. Might be too sweet for me and some other people, but it's a, it's a, it's a very light, airy, phenomenal product. But even brands like McDonald's, the filet of fish and the Big Mac, two items to mention, they were created by franchisees. You know, we're and that constantly is, innovating. That, and that's the best, that is the best part, though, of the franchise process is you have an amazing brain trust. And at Wingstop, I was president of the Franchise Advisory Council. And you, we would get input all the time. I remember when the new franchisee in Idaho called me, you know, like upset about certain things. Can you help me with this, this, and this? I was told by corporate this and this. I can't get certain boxes and I can't this and my distributor doesn't know about whatever. And there's always growing pains in every brand. But, you know, it's, it's, it's expected. If you're doing all this stuff on your own, it's a nightmare. You don't have anybody to rely on that speaks your language because you're creating something that nobody else knows. Lance, why did you choose Krispy Kreme? Because you well, could probably chose a lot of... A Krispy lot of Kreme chose me. So Krispy Kreme, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big connector. And, uh, and, and because of that, I'm like a magnet. People come to me as well. I had a family friend from New York whose family was the first franchisee of Krispy Kreme in New York City. His name's John. John calls me and says, hey, I got a guy that's, a, that's very successful and he's trying, wants to become the franchisee for Nevada. And uh, he doesn't know anything about the business, so he's going to need, need an operator. So that's how we got connected. And he ended up getting the state of Nevada and the state of Utah at the same time. Turned out I didn't get the, I didn't get the position. We didn't become partners at that point. because uh, But we got to know each other incredibly well. I was getting paid a lot of money in those days. And he, um, as a consultant, and I was in the casino business as well as a food and beverage director, so uh, we stayed very close. He hired somebody for a lot less money to get his first store open. And, uh, and that Krispy Kreme in the old days, I mean, it was like $4 a dozen glazed, and they still did over $120,000 opening week wow. so many years ago. And, uh, and nowadays, what's a dozen glazed donuts? Instead of $4, it's nine in, in, in Vegas, probably where I am. But um, 
So no, uh, but years later, uh, we stayed in touch. He, and he had an opportunity. He says, I want to bring you in as, a, as my partner. And uh, what kind of deal would it take? And I'll never forget this. This is, one of, this is a very proud moment in my resume that nobody would know about until now because it's a few people are listening here. Um, and that is, we went out to a fancy dinner in the Bellagio Hotel back in the day, and I, I signed my deal. And with my equity, with my bonuses, I think I got $10,000 as a bonus when I, for every store we opened. And before you knew it, we were doing 25 million a year as a franchise of Krispy Kreme. And we got 10 open. And what, uh, what was interesting is within 90 days, just over 90 days of me being with them, I fixed a lot of the major problems that were giving them a lot of headaches. We went back to dinner. And if I remember, we went to the same exact restaurant. I think it was Chirco at, at Bellagio, the same restaurant. And, and he surprised me and he handed me my new deal. I didn't even ask. I didn't even renegotiate. He handed me my new deal, which got even sweeter because he couldn't believe what I was able to do for him. So that was fantastic. But, you know, after several years at Krispy Kreme as his partner, um, I was bought out and uh, he brought in, I think it was his sister to help him because, you know, Krispy Kreme had some pro growth problems. Um, and that might be a, a part two for us to discuss. But basically, uh, Krispy Kreme. People think a lot of things about what happened to Krispy Kreme way back when there was franchisees that filed bankruptcy. I could tell you in short, um, what they did was they overdeveloped. And what, so for example, Southern California, if I remember correctly, that was one franchisee just in Southern California had a development deal of 22 locations, if I remember correctly. Well, that was far too many. It should have been five or six. And then they could have reevaluated after those were open because sales tell you how you're doing. So um, after, because I think most of the original stores in Southern California opened doing over $200,000 a week, not donuts, $200,000 a week. And then by the time they got to store six or seven, it didn't do anything. I mean, the market was completely saturated. And uh so that's why I encourage, I, part of my business, as you mentioned at the top of this, uh, this uh, conversation, is that I help set up brands, uh, independent businesses, so they can franchise, whether they have 20 locations or one. And that is a conversation I always have in the early days. You're better off being conservative with these development agreements because you need your people. If you have integrity, you need your franchisees to be successful. And you need your franchisees to say nice things about you and the brand and the support and what you do at the marketing fund and all these good things. So Krispy Kreme did not do that at all. They, they, they didn't have an appropriate template. The forethought, everything they thought of did not work. But at the end of the day, they still had a product that was high in demand. They just built the system incorrectly. It's like trying to build a car that'll fly that will never fly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a tough balance. Sometimes you want to grow, but how fast and make sure the market. But is you know there. what? It's not even and, speed. It's yeah. not even speed. I've done things mm -hmm. too fast because I had the wrong partners. Usually it's the operations that fail because people, it's the people, you know, your people can't handle it or you can't handle it. but. You know, Krispy Kreme had the infrastructure, but they did it too. They did it too fast. They had no business opening all of those stores in Southern California at all. <laughs> you know, and and yeah. then there was a retraction. You know, all of a sudden stores are closing because, and it's not because people didn't like the donuts. But you know, what I always use is Starbucks is a perfect example, and it's one of my favorite examples. Starbucks in the early days, I got to meet one of their their first VPs of uh, brand development or marketing. I don't remember what his title was, but he, um, he explained it to me in the early days of Starbucks, it was all about becoming a destination. There were no drive-through stores. They wanted people to go in and have the experience and smell the coffee and see their name on their cup and all these different things. And, you know, hear their name being called, you know, Lance, Lance, here's your latte and, and experience it. That's when they were going to be simply a destination. Well, guess what? Years later, they said, ah, the hell with that. Let's add drive-throughs. We're now going to be a convenience. 
But to their credit, they did take their time in most respects. But then at the end of the day, you probably remember how many years ago was it? Six, seven, seven years ago, they ended up closing 600 stores. Well, most of those stores, I think, if I remember correctly, most of those were, uh, they, I don't think any of them were drive through stores. I think they were all sort of just end caps with no drive throughs because, and it wasn't that they were wrong. It was, you know, they changed their model and they, they went back to those older stores and said, you know, we're going to do drive throughs now because our drive throughs will up our sales 50%. You know, I would love to know, Lance, um, ideal prospective franchisee. Because you talk to a lot of people. Yep. Some of them you may recommend not having a franchise. Some people, certain types of franchises. I wonder if you talk about maybe your high school friend. Yeah. <laughs> this is a funny story. So uh, Stephen came to me. Um, I think my brother sent me a text message and said, hey, Stephen, want, Stephen wants to talk to you about franchising. I said, great, give him my number. So Stephen was, he had one job out of college and joined a privately held company that was outrageously successful. And the reason I tell you this is he's what I call a corporate refugee. Now, in, his, in this case, it was his choice to become a, a corporate refugee. All he knows is the corporate world, hasn't had much exposure, admittedly, to anything else at that stage. Super bright guy, super successful, helped grow a company to gazillions of dollars. And what he was looking for, because it was his first venture, he wanted to stay safe, even though he had quite a bit of money. And he wanted something that was preferably home-based and no brick and mortar involved. So you don't want to get in the restaurant business where it's four hundred thousand a little for a little fast casual brand like Wingstop was back in the day. And uh, so was, I like all of those criteria: safe, yep. check, home-based, check. Well, and that's exactly and yeah. that's exactly what a lot of the corporate guys are okay with. Well, some of the corporate guys though are okay with. You know, look, I call it the profit path. If I can show you, a prospective franchisee, a clear profit path, like we talked about Smash My Trash, when you see their numbers that they're going to show you, you'll fall out of your chair. I mean, it's unbelievable. But they don't have 150 locations open yet. They only have a few, you know, several open. You may have to pay, you know, pound the pay. Exactly. Bit, you know, because you, there's yeah. another thing in the franchise world called proof of concept. Just because you're successful in Paducah, Kentucky, wildly successful. I know people who live in Paducah. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and I'm a guy from Las Vegas that wants to put one of whatever. Well, there's still risk because, you know, I have an IV infusion brand that I represent that's in Liberty, Missouri. Overland Park, Kansas, but they're also in Phoenix. They're also in Dallas, and they're also sold out in Oklahoma. That's enough proof of concept for me. They're in small towns and they're in the large towns. So back to my friend, Stephen, Stephen ended up, he said, and oh, by the way, if you can find something that's a resale, again, a whole other big conversation is about resales because people think resales are great. Well, resales, you're either going to be paying it off a lot because it's a really good resale in that respect very predictable. So you'd be paying a lot. You'd be paying a nice premium because franchises will typically sell for four times cash flow. So then he said, well, if you find a resale, so we explored some resales that were really inexpensive, but they were really inexpensive for a reason. And the numbers didn't pencil out. And the best part of franchising, I should tell you, and your audience would want to hear this, is even after you've talked to all the corporate executives and you have a great comfort level for them, with them, the best piece of the franchise model is that you get to go through some level of validation with existing franchisees, where they hand you a big list and say, hey, call these people, call whoever you want, call five people and ask them how their experience was and report back. And, you know, look, there's a bottom 10% of all franchisees. So you're going to find some franchisees that are not happy. But in some cases, it's probably them. It's not the brand, especially when you talk to a lot of other happy franchisees. So in this case, uh, Stephen could not get the validation done, period, end of statement. And he's like, what do I do? I said, you're done. That's what you do. You're done. You're done with that brand. So I went back to one of the home base brands that I showed him, which by the way, was M3 Linked. And he ended up becoming a franchisee and and I'll leave it at that. There's a lot more that he's doing now with the brand. He's actually an owner of the brand as well. 
He bought it. Lance, I, there's another story I would love for you to tell. I know we're right at the hour. I don't know if you have uh, a few more minutes. I do. To I do. If Absolutely. You don't, we can wrap up. But um, before you tell the story, I want to just point people to where they should contact you. Go to your website. Where should people go online, and how how can they contact you? You will find me. It's Ion Franchising. I O N Franchising dot com. But yeah, on social media, you'll find Ion Franchising. Uh, or my name, Lance Gralick, G-R-A-U-L-I-C-H. There's a lot of misconceptions around franchising. And I would love for you to talk about Schooley Mitchell for a second. Yeah, so oftentimes there's so many people. I spoke to a lady yesterday. It was a banker. And, and she said, you know, I don't know if I can afford this, but my friend told me to call you because I am interested in being my own boss. Every day I'm talking to people that, think that you really have to be a millionaire to own a franchise. And the reality is that is so not the case. Um, it, you know, most people, as long as they have $20,000 cash, and that can't be your last money. Hopefully there's some home equity or stocks or a 401k or some other money you can rely on as well if you need that while you're scaling your business. But Schooley Mitchell is a brand that I love. In fact, I just did a deal with Schooley Mitchell. We'll introduce somebody in there that was successful and they're going to become a Schooley Mitchell franchisee. Schooley Mitchell is about $62,000 started out of your house. That's all it is. $62,000. There's loans available. Now for a typical brand, you can put down 25, 30%, as low as 25% and you're in business. And uh, so $62,000, you're in business with Schooley Mitchell. This is some additional marketing, you know, they'll help you with lead generation but they're vendor watchdogs. They help small and medium-sized businesses reduce their, their, uh, their expenses. And they've been very successful, have an incredible team, an incredible system, like the gentleman I just introduced them to uh, that became a franch is becoming a franchisee. Uh, he, was, he was blown away. He was blown away at their service, blown away at their knowledge, blown away at the systems. He got a tour of the back office and all the tools that he gets as being part of the system. So here's the kicker. $62,000 investment. So I'll, I'll pretend you're someone I've never talked to before, Dr. Jeremy. So what is your expectation on a $62,000 investment of what your, your return on investment would be in anticipated income? You know, I don't know anything about franchise, so I guess I'm a good person to ask, but um, I guess I'd, I'd like to, I mean, I don't know what's possible, but, you know, producing in the first year you know, something that would help me pay that back, obviously. Well, so that, that's great that you also mentioned that. Schooly Mitchell, usually within eight months or so, from what I hear, yeah. you can pay that off in the first year. Now, in any brand, it's going to take you time to really ramp up. There's quite a few brands you're going to, you know, you could triple your revenue of year one in year two. So the exciting part about Schooly Mitchell is they actually have franchisees mature franchisees that have been in the system a number of years that actually net a million dollars a year out of their house. Wow. And absolutely incredible. Now, a lot of times, depending on who the individual I'm talking to is, I don't necessarily even mention that in the first conversation because it could scare them. They think I'm some sort of scammer or I'm exaggerating or lying to them, but this is a reality. And so I tell people, I said, so, so what if you make $250,000 a year out of your house? working with as a Schooley Mitchell franchisee. Oh, that's fantastic. I'll take that too. Well, yeah, so go for it. Now, it depends what your work ethic is. It depends how you are working on your own. And are you going to follow the system? And another great expression you've heard before, are you going to trust the process? <laughs> you know, because if you try to build a better mousetrap with some of these brands, you're going to waste your time and it's not going to work out for you. But, you know, look, a lot of people ask me, well, well when do I get my money back? Well, it's going to depend. Nobody's going to guarantee that. But, you know, so with Schooly Mitchell, you can get your money back within eight months. There's other brands you can get your money back within the same time frame, which would be fantastic. And there's others that could be up to five years. But there's quite a few brands I have. Um, I, have a, I have a friend that owns 20 franchised hair salons. The guy doesn't even have hair. He is, when he was presented with the idea this happens to me a lot. I present people ideas and I warn them in advance. It might not be sexy. You might not love it, but you're going to love the profit path. 
Well, his franchise hair salons, he can pay them off in two years and three months on average. And he today has probably a net income of at least a million, 1.2 to 1.5 million a year off of his hair salons. And he's he just parlays it into the next one, right? That's if it's it. successful, I mean, they also want you to be you know, successful so that they, you keep getting more of their franchises in different areas, right? So what, it's a what win-win. I offer, exactly. What I offer in franchising is truly like a menu in a, in a big restaurant. You know, what would you like? Are you looking for an appetizer? Are you looking for a main course? You know, you're, are you a multi-unit guy, gal, or are you just looking for a, a home-based brand? You can get your money back in eight months and make a, a, a higher income than you're currently making right now. I, I have something for everybody. The question is, who's committed to really doing it? First of all, Lance, thank you. Who should be contacting you? Just to, just to wrap everything up, who should be contacting you? You mentioned the corporate refugee. Who are the type of people that should be contacting you that you've seen? You know, typically half of my business are the corporate refugee types. But the reality is anybody that's interested in having their own business and has no idea how to start it, uh, I, my, my consultations are free. I'm happy to talk to anybody that wants to learn. Sometimes I talk to people and there isn't a deal done for, for five years. In other cases, it could be five weeks. So I'm happy to talk to everybody, but anybody that wants to be their own boss and, you know, uh, has at least $20,000, hopefully some extra above that. So let's, let's say $40,000, $50,000. I have a business for you that you can learn how to make money. Lance, thank you so much. Check out, everyone check out ionfranchising.com and learn more. And Lance, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jeremy, for having me. What I got